Baida, and I'm from Altaristan Red Street in the Netherlands, uh, where I'm responsible for all our business in the international trade industry, including the personal services, as well as government and technology companies. So I'd like to ask you, who has a mobile phone? Please raise your hand. Or an iPad, or you do. All right, we're going to use the poll. So the first poll is, who is today's largest postal services worldwide? So you have an app. Please take out the app from the phone or the iPad or any tablet or whatever device you have. I don't see a lot of people dealing with their phones. Do you have, do you have the apps installed? Yeah. No? Not many. So let's uh, do it differently. The old fashioned way. Raise your hand if your answer is Deutsche Post. <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Raise your hand if you think it's USPS. One. One. Raise your hand if you think it's China Post. Whoa. Quite a lot. And anything else? Raise your hand if you think it's another answer. So, China Post has won big time. I don't know what is the real answer, but if we go to the next slide, then you'll see what I think might be the biggest one. What do you think about this? So the point here, Technology companies have been disrupting traditional markets. You see the, the letters industry that has been taken over by email and instant messaging. What you see here on the left side of the screen, so on the right side, the traditional industry. On the, right si on the left side, the companies that dominate those worlds at the moment. And what is in common to all these companies? Just like the company that Brody mentioned, these companies, they don't have the physical infrastructure that all the companies on the right side have. They are technology companies driven by data. And all of you probably have suffered from that top line here, right? The, the letter business has, has decreased dramatically, taking away a lot of business from you. But then probably you thought, well, the parcel business is growing, right? Before this presentation, I went online and I checked on the websites of a number of the postal services and I saw all over the same story. Parcel business is growing. Great. Is that great? It is for the time being. Is it sustainable for you? No. Why not? The parcel business will continue to grow. But if you don't change things that you do today, you will be out of the game. And I will explain. Uber has launched a service for parcel delivery. Amazon. Amazon also launched, has its own logistic service and now they want to offer logistic services or they have started already actually to offer logistical services to other e-commerce platforms. You would say competitors. So what you see, what is in common to those two companies again? Technology and data. Those are companies that use the data in order to create new markets. And what they do is, they do something really well for themselves and then they go do it for somebody else. Because if you do it so well for yourself, why not do it for somebody else? That is what Amazon is doing here. And what you see is that these companies disrupt you. And maybe those services of Amazon and Uber haven't yet uh, reached Europe, but they will. So if you don't plan and if you don't do something to counter those threats for your markets, that is why I said, then your business will be taken over by them and by their lives. So this is the story. Most of the postal services that I have had the pleasure to work with 
are traditional companies. Quite a few are also either in the past or still in the present state owned. So they don't have often the same um, drive such as Amazon or Uber and the like have in exploring new territories. And this is where I would like to urge you to go with data in order not to become the redundant in this sector. Because if you don't act, they will take over. This story is about how we help our clients use data in order to do both the exploitation, which refers to doing the things that you do more efficiently, and the exploration, being more the innovative side, developing new ideas and, and, and implementing them. How we do it is, it starts on the left side, goes to the right. So, the collection of data. In our case, we are the leader worldwide in providing data about companies. So, we're talking about here about your B2B activities, not the B2C activities. So, collecting data about companies, making the richest, creating the richest available database with data about companies. But then it's not really about the data, right? It's about the insights that we create thanks to that wealth of data. So, when you collect a lot of data, one of the big issues is how do I make sense out of this data? And in order to make sense out of data, you need to be able to identify for every little piece of data about whom does it actually talk. Because if we hear about 38, and we know it's a shoe size, but you don't know it's hers, then still the data is useless. Okay, so that is the first thing we do with the data. Okay, the identity resolution. Then, once we know about which company the data actually is, we connect that piece of data to all the other pieces of data that we have. In order to generate the richest insights that we have about that entity, the company. With those insights, we go to our clients and then we integrate our data into their systems with their data. Why? Because even though our data about companies is the richest available in the world, you also have a lot of very rich data. And the best power can be achieved if we actually combine the two data sets. And that is when you are available to do analytics with all of that data. And I will give you in a few minutes some examples for those kind of analytics projects. But Brody also described a few projects also very similar to what we have been doing with our clients. Dana Bretzi, just a little bit of background. Do you want to become a US president? Because if you do, come work for us. Four, four American presidents have been already uh, um, uh, working for, for Dana Bretzi. Um, largest provider of data about companies worldwide. Every day we do 5 million updates to our database. 5 million. That's immense. The number of... We, we have a database with the largest number of companies worldwide. It says it's 270 million plus. I actually checked yesterday it was already about 280. So it's growing fast. And the important thing is that because we have been doing this since 1984, eight, sorry, since 1841, we know what, how companies operate. We know what is normal and what is not normal. So when you have a new client or prospect or supplier, you may not know them. We can tell you a lot about them and we can tell you whether what happens with them makes sense. And this is how we use our data. So Dun & Bradford is a global name. It's available all over, all over the world, but in different countries you may actually know it under different names. So I put here a few so you can see how, how, the, how it is actually called in your country. So in, in the Benelux, in the Netherlands where I work, we call it Altares Dun & Bradford. In France it's Altares, in Germany it's Bisnau, etc. Second poll, 
How many by now have the app available? Please raise your hand if you have the app. Okay, very few. It looks like a so we, we'll do it. Let's do it still by hand. All right. So the question is, have you built predictive models into your ongoing automated operations? So the answer is yes across all operations, yet two, yes in one or two specific areas, three, it's an ongoing project, four, I'm thinking about it, haven't yet done it, five, I don't know where to start, and six, the expected ROI doesn't justify it. So, raise your hand if your answer is yes, number one. Silence. We have one in the back. One. <laughs> Excellent. From which organization? Brilliant. And one in the very back back here as well. What company? Excellent. I'm very happy to hear those two. Um, then the second option. Yes, in one or two specific areas. Be brave, I see. folks. Come on. <laughs> one, two, three, four. Five, six, all right. Then the third answer. No, fourth one. I see here one. All right, five. You know it's number five, right? Answer five, one. And answer six. We clearly have okay. seven so, here. I have no clue. Rachel yes. Has. Okay. So indeed, I would say for those who didn't answer, it's probably not one and two. I would guess. The answer is, or, or what I want to make here, the point I want to make is one of the lessons learned from us working with a lot of companies worldwide. And again, Maybe it's not a coincidence that we both use Amazon as an example because it's one of the leading companies in this area. Amazon has a patent on actually sending products before they have been ordered. How does that make sense? Sending a book to, to me before I've actually ordered it. It's a risk, right? The answer is because they have a lot of data and they analyze it. They look at uh, how many clients there are in different regions. How is the behavior of these clients? How likely are clients to buy? They look at the time, for example, before Christmas, the behavior would be different than just in the middle of the year. They look at all the data that they have and they're able to predict with a certain likelihood that somebody in that region will buy this book to, with tomorrow. So they will already ship it. And if it's not me, then it's probably going to be my neighbor. And if it's not my neighbor, then they will have shipped it in such a way that they can still reroute the shipment to another location. This is the power of data. Because thanks to a patent like this, they're actually able to deliver the commodity much faster. And if I know that they can deliver it faster, I'm more likely to buy on Amazon than to buy somewhere else. And while Amazon is really the leading company or one of the leading companies there, and I don't expect everybody to be like Amazon because that's a very high benchmark, a lot of companies in the, in the private sector have already implemented prediction into their processes. It can be in different areas of the operations. And this is what your disruptors are doing, companies like Amazon, Uber, and the like. So the, 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 the message here is, if you haven't implemented yet prediction into your business processes, you need to do it. Because otherwise, those companies will use exactly this method. And this is how we do uh, analytics at, at Down and Bradstreet. I, I said we have a lot of information sources. I think it's at 30,000 information sources. What we do is we collect all of them and we make sense out of the data. And for example, um, well, two-thirds of, uh, two of the US GDP 
that is equal to the Fortune 500 companies. 90% of the Fortune 500 use our data in the daily business process, 90%. It means that we know when, uh, when somebody is going to do business with somebody else, because that's when they come to us to get data from us, right? So imagine there is a company and every week we get 500 requests for data about that company. And suddenly this week we get 1,000 and next week 2,000. It's a sign that something happened. We don't know yet what, okay? If we call a call center, if we call a company 10 times and they don't pick up the phone, it's a sign that something is happening there, okay? So we collect a lot of those signs that by themselves maybe don't say exactly what's happening. We feed them all into our analytics platform. We call those signs, well, signal data. And eventually, we run the analytics and create models to predict the behavior of the company. So based on all those signs, we can see that there is a positive trend, a negative trend, a higher chance that they will fail next year, a smaller chance, etc. And those insights, those predictions, those are the insights that we sell to our clients. Okay? Always collecting the data, analyzing it, and then making it available. The third question, and that is the last question I'm going to ask today, is what does big data actually mean? Okay, so the first answer is a volume, large volumes. The second says different types. The third one talks about uncertainty in the data. The fourth one is streaming data. Fifth one is all of the above. And six is any combination. So what does big data actually mean to you? Okay, a lot of people talk about big data, but what is it? Who thinks it's number one? Okay, now I'm perplexed. Because normally that's when everybody raises their hand. So are you sleeping or do you think it's a different answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the Chinese menu, they want all of the above. Six. Number six, okay. Who thinks it's number six? All right, who thinks it's number five? There is no <laughs> Yes, okay, correct, that is correct. So the answer is, I can give you a formal definition, but I actually don't use it very often. Because I think big, big is a relative term, okay? If we look at a formal definition, it's this. It's the combination of all the four, or a subset, so any combination of the four. The volume, the veracity, velocity, and um, the variety. But, concretely, for every one of you, what it means. In my view, if you are dealing with a data problem that is more complex than what you are used to deal with, for you it's big data. You don't need to compare yourself to organizations like Amazon or, let's say, HMRC UK that has an enormous IT environment. You don't need to do that. If it's complex for you, the analysis of data, then for you it's a big data effort. But still bearing in mind, the parameters that influence, that cause the complexity, are indeed those mentioned here. And then clients ask me, so do I need to do something about big data? Everybody does, but actually I heard also some questions about what is the ROI? And it's a very justified question. So imagine you want to travel from Paris to New York. So you need a means of transportation. And then comes a salesperson from Mercedes and wants to sell you a great, great Mercedes. Fantastic. The best one. It's great, but what's the ROI for you if you want to travel from Paris to, 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 to New York? Zero, okay? So the point here is that in order to achieve 
the ROI, you actually you need to understand very well the problem domain, traveling from Paris to New York, and the solution that is that you're looking at. Because maybe it is a great solution that you're looking at, it just not fit for what you are, what you need. And when we talk about transport from Paris to New York, then it's easy for everyone to understand that the car wouldn't bring you there. But when we talk about data, it's more difficult. Because a lot of people have less experience with data, and because you can't really see, oh, this data solution, would it really be work on it? And that can create skepticism or fear because you don't have the same level of understanding. The answer here is there are no short shortcuts. You need to do your due diligence. But saying I don't travel to New York because the car won't be able to bring me there, for you, of course, it's a ridiculous example, right? You, you would never do that. Well, the same goes for data. That's the change in, in mind shift that, that is required sometimes. And you don't necessarily need to engage in big data, large, flashy projects, no. You can start very small with doing very specific projects that solve very specific problems with very specific return on investment. So what you need is the right data for the right problem and not just big data for the sake of doing big data. And maybe it sounds obvious, but I've seen a lot of situations where it went wrong just because there was some CXO that said we need to do big data and there wasn't enough understanding of what actually can be achieved and what should be achieved and how. And that's when it fails. And when it fails, then afterwards you say, all right, it failed, so we're not going to do it. But that is not the... Uh, uh, that is then not the constructive way to do it. I was asked to present to you a few examples of projects that we have been doing with other clients in your industry but also outside. So I have a few of them here and the HML that you will see on the screen um, thought it is the complexity level in terms of data analysis, high, medium, low. Okay, these are just four different areas, it's not a SWOT analysis. So the first one that I want to mention, very simple. Uh, I'm working now with a client, one of you actually, um, about a very, very simple solution. They want to be able to sell through the website. And one of the problems by doing that is potential clients, they start filling in their data and it's so it takes them too long, they don't have patience, they abort and they never buy the service. The easy way to solve it is as soon as they start typing in the data, we pre fill the rest of the data. So let's say you start writing, um, let's say, um, client would say Philips Medical Systems, somebody would start filling in Philips Medical Systems, a web service goes to our database, fetches the data of Philips puts it in the website, the client just needs to confirm without typing in all the data. Such a simple solution increases the conversion rate. Okay? Basically, very limited effort required to implement. Another example is, maybe they fill in their data and you're going to offer them all the same service. But if you knew it's Philips, compared to if you, you knew it's a one-man shop around the corner, you would offer them something else. So, the other side, the, 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 the next step is, based on understanding who this is, retrieve data about that company to understand who they really are, what is the credit risk with them, what is the expected revenue from them, and then tailor the offering that you show to them. Very simple solutions available also web services. The next one is around compliance. I've been working a lot with customs organizations. Customs needs to check, you know, the, to enforce the laws around import and export, exports. Whenever you do in cross-border shipments, customs is involved. A 
at least outside the EU. So what happens there is that Customs does their risk management, but very often parcels would be delayed because Customs is unable to anticipate what is the risk. Right? So random selections, high percentage. You can actually help them. You can use data in order to find out compliance problems in your shipments. What if you have a shipment from China to Germany and it's a shipment of, of t-shirts or whatever, but we can tell you that this company is actually dealing in electronics. Very simple check and you know there is a, a compliance uh, problem there. Okay. The third one is prospecting, so lead generation, marketing. This is actually just what Brody also talked about. By since we know all the companies in the world, well, more or less, we can also tell you who are likely to be your next clients by analyzing their characteristics together with the characteristics of those, let's say, that would be your typical clients. And the last one is with our more mature clients, we work on custom risk models. So imagine, for example, we can tell you the likelihood of failure of a company, the likelihood that they go out of business. And of a lot of you use such services for your clients, for credit risk. Okay? And we have this as a standard offering. But with some of our more data savvy clients, we actually combine the data, our data with theirs, and create a very specific uh, model for you. And then what we can do, use also machine learning techniques in order for the model to keep improving itself, so maintaining itself. Because models that you don't improve, next year they won't be as predictive as they are today. And the last thing, again, since I was asked to show a few examples for this sector, I'm sure a lot of you know this company even better than I do. It's one of our clients in the US. And this is, uh, these are two case studies. So it's publicly available information. You can find it on the internet for work that we have done with them. It's a company that has really transferred from a traditional mailing company to a data savvy company. Okay? A company that uses data to predict who are my likely next clients. A company where we have looked at all of their databases and we found a lot of duplications. So what we do is we map all of the clients that they have into our database and maybe in, in one database it would say they have a client IBM, in the other database it would say international business machines. So they think it's two different clients, but we're able to tell them because we match it to our database we are able to tell them it's actually the same one. And this is what makes it possible for them to create the holistic view of all their operations with the client. So, based on all of that, the call for action, I made a very a blunt statement in the beginning in order to take you a little bit out of the comfort zone, saying, if you don't act, those companies, those technology companies, will conquer your markets. How can you act? The answer is, one of, there are a few answers. There isn't just one golden answer, right? Amazon is doing a lot of things right. So I want to put this in proportion. This is not the whole answer. But data can give you the competitive edge. Data is the weapon that they use against you. Use it against them. Thank you.